Hey, g'day, it's Prezo here. Welcome back to the shop. Uh, guess what we're doing today? That's right, we're doing some metal casting. It's been a while since I've got into this, uh, but I've got a new set of tools and some new patterns, so let's have a look at those. This is the first tool that I've made since my last metal casting video. This is an SW Dweeb approved sand ramming tool. And if you've not checked out that channel, have a look. SW Dweeb, oh, I'm going to call him Perry, that's too hard to say <laughs> his YouTube handle name. But Perry does some amazing stuff at home. And he's just recently put out a series of short videos which breaks down metal casting into easy to understand steps. So if you're looking to get started in the hobby, he's put together a series of basically essential skills videos. It also deals with terminology, uh, getting used to the sort of tools and equipment that you need and just uh, basic preparatory steps for the metal casting process. So that's the first one. This is the second tool that I made. Uh, this is a wrapping tool. Uh, it's used to uh, wrap the patterns backwards and forwards in the sand mold so that when you withdraw them from the mold, they come out cleanly. Now, a gentleman named Sandrammer uh, watches my videos and he got in touch with me and offered to make me a tool like this one. Now, Sandrammer is an ex-naval metallurgist and he specialized in metal casting. And once again, check out his channel. He's got some awesome content on there about metal casting and metallurgy in general. And uh, I didn't want to put him to any trouble. So I said, no, it's no problem. I'll make one. And I made this one out of quarter inch mild steel rod and realized later it was probably a bit light. I sent him a photo anyway, and he said, yep, it's too light. I'll make you a new one anyway. So <laughs> thanks very much for that. It's on the way. But just for today, I'm going to try this one out. All right, so these are the patterns we're going to be working with. Now, all of these relate to my Bridgeport milling machine. These two here are for an air power draw bar. This one is a bracket to hold the work light on the side of the Bridgeport ram. And these two here are brackets to make a collet rack. Now, you can buy those collet racks. They're die cast aluminium, I think. And they're, they're very hard to get here in Australia. But I can fabricate one by making two brackets and then making the, collet, the flat collet rack part from some carbon fiber. Now, all of these patterns are the same in that they're single sided. So instead of being a split pattern where you have half the pattern in the drag and half in the cope, these can all be made by having the pattern in either the cope or the drag. Now, one of the things I've learned about metal casting, and I've been doing this for about eight years now off and on, but it's not my main hobby, it's just something I do when I need to have a casting for another project. But one of the things I've learned is that you can get results with metal casting very early on without having a lot of knowledge. But if you want to improve your castings and get better quality castings, you need to improve your technique. Now I've been very fortunate that I've had a number of mentors who've been only too happy to give me advice and correct my technique. Uh, probably the one that's given me the most help is Old Foundryman. Now, once again, check out his channel if you haven't seen it already. But he's a true professional. He, that that's, was his job, basically, was making castings. And he's been very willing to give me advice and uh, tell me when I'm doing things wrong, <laughs> which is quite often. And uh, we've, we've sort of worked together on a number of projects. But what I want to show you is, uh, not, I'm not going to show you all of these castings, that would get boring, but I want to show you uh, the technique that I'm going to use, which is completely the opposite to what I would have normally had done. So when I started doing this, I would have put this pattern in the drag and the cavity would be upside down. The metal would flow in through this surface here and then flow downhill into the drag. Now, that seems logical, doesn't it? You think, well, the metal want to flow downhill, it'll fill up this cavity until it comes flush with that surface there and job done. But the problem is that, well, I believe anyway, that caused a lot of turbulence as the metal's flowing into the mold. Now it would be, in my view, better to have this in the cope, have the entry point for the metal at the bottom, and then have this slowly fill up with metal as it comes to the top, the highest points which are here. And what this means is that you get much less or much lower velocity of metal going into the cavity and then there's less chance of disturbance of the mould, there's less chance that air is going to get drawn in and create oxides and, and bubbles and so on. 
So that's what I'm going to try. Um, I, I'm not sure whether that's the correct technique. Somebody will, will tell me. <laughs> but I'm going to give it a go. So let's get a couple of these moulds prepared and we'll pour them and see how they turn out. So this is what I'm thinking for this first set of castings. Now, this is a left and a right hand pair and I'm thinking they're going to go diametrically oppo opposed like that and we're going to have a large riser in between the two patterns. We'll have the sprue out here and then we'll have a runner going between the two. Now as it turns out <laughs> my mentor Martin got in touch with me like about an hour ago with this suggested method and what he's also suggested is that we try one set of castings with the patterns in the cope and the other set of castings that's these ones here with the pattern inverted in the drag just to see if there's a difference and I'm all for experiment so let's give it a go. Now in order to get the, the height that I need with these boxes these are only 68 millimeters deep I've added an extension on top of the cope, so that's 68 plus 42, and that's going to give me the height that I need to get the metal to run. So I'll get this all ready, and I'll bring it back when we're ready to uh, ram up the top. So here's the arrangement. We've got a tapered sprue uh, entering here, We've got a very large riser in between the two patterns, and we'll have a runner which is in the drag, and gates which I think are going to go in the cope. So they'll join up to our two patterns, they're going to come a fair way up the vertical side of the patterns. So I get all this rammed up and then we'll make a second mould, but this time we're going to invert the pattern and put it all in the drag. Right, so there's the top of our cope. We'll cut the basin now and we want that to be fairly close to our sprue and fairly close to this edge of the cope. So we can get the, the crucible in close when we go to pour this. So I've got a black line marked on my piece of tubing there. That's how deep we want to go. Uh, just pulls a plug of sand out, or nearly all of it anyway. Alright, so the, uh, the little ridge in between the basin and the screw needs to be no more than 10 millimeters high. It's one thing I learned from Martin. <laughs> and the bottom of this um, basin needs to be kept, kept fairly flat. Not a saucer shape, it should just be a sharp edged depression. Alright, so basin, sprue, riser. So the next thing you want to do is to join the bottom of the sprue to the bottom of the riser. So I'm going to put that part in the drag at least. So there's our runner. So 
I think the plan here is to put the gates in between the riser and the pattern. Now, unfortunately, I didn't uh, print in any holes uh, when I made these patterns, either 3D printed patterns. And that means that the screws aren't biting terribly well into that material. Um, got plenty of draft on there, so let's hope we can get them out. Yeah, that thing's a bit light. All right, let's try this method instead. That's better. I can actually hear that coming loose. All right. Now I got a bit of breakaway on this edge here. But that's just going to be flash on the finished casting, so I'm not too bothered. Okay, we get this blown out, put it back together, and we'll try the other one. Okay, trial close. So that's one of the good things about having all the pattern in the coat is that any sand that does fall will go into the cavity where the, the runner is going to go. That's better. Okay, put this one aside and we'll make up the other mold. So this one's a little bit more conventional in that we're going to put the cavity in the drag and it's a single sided pattern so it's similar to these but we're just inverting it just to see if we get a difference. All right, so this time rise is going to be a bit smaller.
So I'm thinking with this one, we're going to put the, the runner in the, the cope. And we're just going to go straight across. Why? I don't know. <laughs> So I'm guessing that what happens here is the metal runs down the sprue, it uh, makes its way across the runner into the cavity which of course is upside down and then as that fills it'll come up the riser. So I just want to round off some of these edges just to reduce turbulence. I've got to get myself a little brush for doing this. Okay, so I think that's good. Alrighty, let's melt some metal. Uh, unfortunately, being a one-man show, you tend to miss things. I moved this uh, so I could get at the pouring basin more easily and I think I shifted out of the field of view of the camera. But hopefully I got you to see that you have to keep that pouring basin full and it's got to continue to run down the sprue without dragging any air with it. What I've noticed is that uh, it tends to back up and then all of a sudden suck down the sprue fairly quickly and you've got to catch it and keep filling that uh, basin. Uh, and it, it overflowed a little bit, but that's a good thing. Okay, let's see how we went. Alright, so far so good. Oh, steaming up my glasses a bit. <laughs> That's turned out pretty good. Happy with that. Let's check the other one. All right, so this is the more conventional way of doing it. This had the cavity in the drag and the metal flowed downhill under gravity and filled this cavity up in the bottom half of the mold. And is it any better? Oh, I don't know. Probably got a bit more shrinkage on the top, you know. So no doubt somebody will tell me I did the wrong thing there. <laughs> but I can make that into a serviceable casting, that's fine. All right, let's see how we went here. Okay, I'm happy with that. I'm counting that as a win. Um, there's a little bit of uh, pitting at the top here. I'm guessing that's where some sand broke away when I removed the pattern and probably lodged in the top of the cavity there. 
but structurally that's sound I'm happy with that let me cool this down we'll talk about the structure of it okay so this is the structure and remember that this entire casting was formed in a cavity which is in the cope that's the top box in the flask and this is uh, something that I would not normally have done I would have inverted this casting and done it all in the drag which is the bottom box but I was just interested to see if this made a difference so the metal would have entered uh, from the, the basin goes over this little ridge here down the tapered sprue and along this runner now the runner was formed in the drag which is the bottom box it went past the, the feeder and the riser and continued on through this little runner here or gate sorry and into the cavity which forms the casting so uh, normally I would have put the, the feeder and the riser on the other side of the cavity and that works uh, but it can also go on this side here and just at the junction between the runner and the gate and that once again seems to work okay so um, am I happy with the casting? yeah it's as good as I normally get I, I don't know if there's any real advantage in doing it this way not for me anyway but this will clean up quite well now these sets of castings here were done in the same way with the, the castings in the coat right this one I did in the method I would normally use where I put the pattern in the drag so this one was cast basically upside down with the metal flying in through the side here there's the the gate there and is it any better or worse not really <laughs> it's about the same so there you go I've got a lot of castings now and uh, I've got a lot of work involved in getting these cleaned up and interestingly these here, um, because of the amount of dra uh, draft angle on these, I've realised now that I have to be able to machine all of this curved surface here to make it square to this top surface here. So that's going to be a bit of a mission on the milling machine, but we'll do that later. Mm -hmm. You can tune in for that, that's going to be fun. So look, I think we're just about done here now, and hang on, who's that? Hey, it's old Founderman. How are you, mate? Yeah? Yeah, no. No, I did that. Yeah, I, I left a 10 millimeter high ridge between the basin and the sprue. No, I did that too. I rounded it off where it went into the sprue. What? No, I did not bury a dead cat under an aluminium tree at midnight. No, sorry. Okay, I'll try better next time. Okay, see ya. Oh, where am I going to get a dead cat at this time of the day? <laughs>